Well, the first funeral I ever did was for a 28-year-old wife and mother of three children, all under the age of six. She died of a brain tumor. And the funeral home people said that when I finished my talk, typically the pastor then walks down and stands next to the casket as people file by. Well, so I did that. And what I witnessed was maybe the saddest thing I've ever experienced in my life. The first people to come up were Jory's husband. Her name was Jory Parker. Jory's husband, David, and their three small children. And David was holding the youngest, and the other two, ages three and five, came up to the casket and stood on their tiptoes to look in to see their mom one last time. And it actually hit me so hard I had to sit down on the front row. I thought I was gonna, I thought I was gonna faint. And part of the thought that went through my mind was, you know, I, I believe God's called me to serve him and to be a pastor and stuff, but if I have to do stuff like this at, on a regular basis, there's no way. There's no way I'm gonna make it. I just can't. Well, I don't know about you. I think this is cutting out or something. Is that okay? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I hate cancer. I hate cancer. Now, hate is a strong word. It's one people don't even use anymore. It's not politically correct to use the word hate. It's too aggressive. It's too negative. But I hate cancer. I hate what it does to people. I hate what it does to marriages. I hate what it does to families and children. I hate what it does to friendships. My favorite cousin... Her name was Diane Casey. She died of cancer in her early 40s, leaving three kids, her husband, both her parents, two brothers behind. My sister, Julie, died of cancer at age 44, leaving behind three children, her husband, our mom, and five of us siblings. My favorite brother-in-law, Jerry, died of pancreatic, pancreatic cancer 10 years ago. He was one of the nicest people to ever meet in your life. All three of these people, in fact, were phlegmatic, laid back, kind, nice, caring, selfless people. Jerry left behind my sister Anne, four children, and many, many grandchildren. In recent years, we've lost people in our church uh, to cancer. Don Darnell, Carol Carr, Jim Jensen, Terry Haney. How many of you here, your family has been touched in some way or another by this thing called cancer? Raise your hand. Just about everybody. You know, cancer is no respecter of persons. Billionaire Steve Jobs and Paul Allen died of cancer. George Harrison and Wayman Tisdale died of cancer. About six months ago, I was working on what series to do in the new year, 2020. And for some reason, this idea, idea of addressing cancer kept coming to mind. And of course, my immediate thought was, that would be way too depressing. You know, we can't, we can't do that. But then I thought, on the other hand, there are so many people have either dealt with cancer themselves or certainly have loved ones who have. I felt like maybe God was sort of nudging me to, to give a biblical perspective on this modern day plague called cancer. So that's what we're doing today and next Sunday. And both weeks I'm going to have people from right here in our church family come up and kind of tell their stories. Here's one Bible passage that I think speaks to those going through this awful thing called cancer. Paul writes, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly or physically we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Now some of you may have gotten caught up on those words where it says for our light and momentary troubles, cancer is anything but light and momentary. But the Bible has a lot more to say about adversity, and pain, and disease, and loss, as we'll see it in a little bit in next week. Did you know that the earliest evidence of cancer was found among bones in Egyptian mummies? Those date back some 3,000 years. 
Uh, from then, clear up until the Renaissance period, which was about 1300 through 1600 AD, cancer was considered untreatable. In fact, in some places, it was considered contagious. And so those suffering from it were forced outside of the towns and villages they lived in. It was in the Renaissance period that doctors began to do autopsies, and that's when they began to understand better the effects and the causes of cancer. Here's how the Cancer Society defines it. It is the uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in the body. It's like the simplest version right there. Cancer is the uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in the body. There are currently over 100 different types or kinds of cancer. The most common are breast, lung, prostate, colon, and melanoma. Now, we all get sick from time to time, but most sicknesses don't last that long. If you have a headache, it might last a couple hours. A cold lasts a few days. An upset stomach, maybe a day at the most. The flu, perhaps 10 days. Some injuries, like a surgery, might require a few months of rehab. Cancer patients are different. They are in a grinding marathon, often with no end in sight. And this cancer marathon can go on for months and months and sometimes year after year after year. Medical tra treatments can become incredibly expensive. Even those who have good health insurance have out-of-pocket experiences that are just overwhelming. And of course, sometimes you can't work, and so Obviously, that has a huge financial effect. But it's just this accumulation of fear and suffering and all the maze of decisions you have to go through. And hopefully, you're making the right decisions along the way. Now, thankfully, cancer deaths have been dropping in our country. Deaths from cancer fell 2.2% from 2016 to 2017. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but that's almost 3 million people who are still alive in our country because of this. Research gains have just exploded the scientific knowledge of cancers and treatments that are going to continue to evolve and save many, many more millions of lives, probably some of ours. Advances in prevention, early detection, surgery, and other treatments, it's the best it's ever been, and it's just going to continue to get better and better. On the other hand, an estimated 1.8 million Americans will receive a cancer diagnosis in 2020. That's about, and about 600,000 people will die. Now this picture of the stadium, there's about 84,000 people in there. If you filled it and emptied it and filled it and emptied it and filled it and emptied it seven times, that's the number of people in America that will die of cancer in 2020. Now, in just a little bit, I'm going to be joined up here by two people who are living their cancer story right now. But first, I want to ask and try to answer a really, really important question, and that is that why does God even allow something like cancer, this terrible plague of cancer? Why does he even allow it? We say he's a good God. He's an all-powerful God. Why does he let this go on? And sometimes, I mean, young children get cancer for crying out loud. Why does God allow this? Well, we all know that bad things happen. We all know that bad things happen to good people. But why does God allow it? Why is there starvation and terrorism and diseases and terrible tragedies like a car jumps uh, the curb by Moore High School and it, it kills two students and injures seriously others? Why do things like Hurricane Katrina and tornadoes and traffic accidents that take lives. Why do these things happen? Well, contrary to some popular teaching among Christians today, it says that Christians should always be healthy, wealthy, and happy. And that Christians don't suffer or experience tragedies that non-believers do. However, 1 Peter 4, verse 12 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. So we are not immune. The question is not, do storms strike? We know the answer to that one. The question is, why? And I want to give you four reasons as taught by the Bible. Number one, some of the suffering and pain that we experience in life is what you might call self-induced or self-inflicted. 
From the beginning, God created human beings with a free will. We're not robots. We can, he gave us the opportunity to, to live how we want to live, to make the choices in life that we want to make, where we want to live, what career to have, whether to get married or not, whether to love God or not. And when we make wise decisions, life usually goes pretty well for us. When we make, we make bad decisions, destructive choices, then often we reap some pretty negative consequences. Say someone chooses to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day for 30 to 40 years. They get lung cancer, and they say, I'm a good person. I go to church. You know, how could God do this to me? A person has an alcoholic drink or five or ten and drives a car or drives a boat, and then so-called accidents happen. And at the funeral, everyone says, how could a loving God bring such a tragedy to this family? A workaholic spends 70, 80, 90 hours a week at the office. All of their energy, all of their attention goes, is devoted to their career. A few years later, the kids are rebellious, the marriage is falling apart, and he blames God. As much as we hate to admit it, some of our problems and our suffering in life is the result of our own bad choices. A second reason for a lot of the suffering and pain in our world are the bad choices or the unwise choices of others. In other words, a drunk driver jumps a highway median and kill, hits a car head on and killing three people. A woman is raped. An elderly couple is swindled out of their life savings. Or a terrorist bombing takes place on a bus or in a mall and maims and kills all kinds of innocent people. In other words, someone exercises their free will and does something reckless, maybe even evil, and their bad choices affect the lives of innocent people. It's not fair, but human beings are not pre-programmed robots. And sometimes innocent people suffer because of someone else's ill-advised or possibly even evil and intentional actions. Number three, the Bible says we live in a sin-tainted, fallen world. The Bible says that as the result of the fall of man in the garden, the world, including humankind, was thrown into a kind of chaos and death. The entrance of sin and rebellion against God not only had spiritual ramifications, but even nature itself, the Bible says, was thrown into chaos and disorder. Before the fall, there were no tornadoes, no droughts, no plagues, no diseases, no death. If there had been no sin, there would be no murder, betrayal, destructive weather events, babies born with disabilities, and no cancer. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, fourth, the Bible would say because of the evil one, Satan. His agenda is stated very plainly in verses like John 10:10, 10, 10, where Jesus said that Satan's mission is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, I know some of you may be saying, really, in 2020, you know, people still believe in the devil? I'm not saying that everything in the Bible is easy to accept or believe, but I think all of us here would acknowledge there is evil in the world. There is evil in the world. And yes, some of it comes from our own stupid or maybe even evil choices. And we reap, the, you know, the consequences of that. Some of it happens because of the evil choices of others. And innocent people are affected. Sometimes it's just the fact that we live in this sin-tainted world that, has been, that was damaged at the fall. And the Bible contends, though, that the explanation behind some that you see is just this evil force known as Satan. Now, some churches say that even asking questions like this is inappropriate. You should never ask or question God, like, God, why do you allow you know, bad things to happen to good people? They say you should never question God. He is sovereign. His plan is perfect. You should, you know, if you have enough faith, you'll never have any doubts. But that contradicts what you read all through the Bible. Some of the greatest people of faith, from Abraham to Moses, David, Elijah, Jeremiah, Mary, Peter, Paul, so forth, they all had doubts. Some were angry at God. Some even basically cussed God out. They openly expressed their doubts about God and God's goodness. They questioned why God would allow such terrible things to happen to them and people they love. Here's just one little example in, in Psalm 22. David writes, My God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Of course, this was quoted later by Jesus on the cross. Why are you, are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I find no rest. But these questions like, how can we know if there really even is a God? And if there is a God, if he's good, if he's so powerful, why does he let these terrible things happen? These are questions that have been expressed by humans since the beginning of life on earth. And, you know, sometimes it's hard, even with the Bible, it's hard to get answers that really satisfy us. But, you know, as much as human knowledge has expanded over time, we still can't claim, even those who are atheists or humanists, to know and understand everything, like exactly what causes cancer and what the true ca uh, cure for cancer might be. It's all still a mystery. Well, right now, I want to invite someone up on stage. And uh, you probably met her before. I did a little interview with her a couple of years ago. I, I, hopefully, I will handle it better this time. And uh, we connected about three years ago and uh, when I was rehabbing my shoulder. and. Uh, so let's hear it for Christine Cooper. Come on up, come on up, Christine. I know we talked about this briefly when you came up before, but remind them of when uh, you know when we met and how that happened. The first time, okay. long time oh, ago. Long time long ago. Time ago. So uh, Cynthia Craddock. Some of you who've been in the church for a long time may remember Cynthia Craddock, who is now Cynthia Craddock Cooper. And I went to school together, and uh, she invited me. This was when we were in the Boomer Theater down on Asp Street. And I, from the first day that, that I came, the first Sunday that I came, I fell in love with it. Um, I have to say that at that time, you were even a little more goofy than you are now. And that, that really appealed to me because I was, I think I was 13. I was, I was somewhere around there, 13. And the same, I was on the same level. It, totally, totally. Mm. No, um, you know, he, you all know because you've heard him speak. Mm. He doesn't stand up here and um, take himself too seriously and is just very real. And he spoke to me. At 13, he spoke to me. He, it, he wasn't talking at me. I felt like he was talking more with me. Um, I felt like he, even at 13, like I felt like he, I was not a forgotten person in here. I was, he wasn't just talking to the grown-ups that I counted and I mattered. And it, I, it was just, I felt very, very comfortable. So I, I did that for a while and then I became, you know, an idiotic, crazy teenager person. Um, later and um, and didn't continue going to church but then in September of 2016 I was diagnosed with uh, you know stage 3c ovarian cancer which is a terminal diagnosis and I had to have a huge surgery that I had to recover from and then uh, seven months of chemotherapy and part of my chemotherapy side effects are that I have neuropathy in my hands and my feet where I, I can't feel very well at that point. I mean, I can't physically feel very well. And I had very poor balance. I was having a very difficult time walking. I was very close to needing a walker. And I asked my physician if I could get into physical therapy to see if that might help. And it was in physical therapy or rehab, as we like to call it. <laughs> we met in rehab. And... <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I, you know, I, I just turned 50, so I was, 40, I was 46, actually, when I saw you at rehab, and I, I was not well. I mean, well, you, you probably remember. I mean, I was not well, and I didn't, I don't even know if I had hair then. Uh, I can't remember, yeah, but I didn't look good, and, uh, <laughs> and I didn't expect him to remember me. I saw him walk by, and I was like, oh. <gasps> he's still here and I thought he might have a church and I was like hey Rusty because that's what we used to call you mm -hmm. and he didn't say hello he didn't say who are you he didn't say how's it going he said oh nobody calls me that anymore 
That, that's what he said. And oh, I can't remember that, <laughs> but I'll take your word for it. I just, <clears throat> I was like, okay, well, hey, do you remember me? I'm Christine. And and it, anyway, we talked, and it was wonderful. And and he invited me to church, and literally that weekend, it was that the first, Sunday, the Sunday. Mm -hmm. I came. I came into church, and I'm here to tell you, I walked through those doors right there, and I, it was palpable. I walked through those doors, and I knew I was home, and I'll, I'll never forget that as long as I live. As long as I live, I'll never forget that. It was like when I was 13 and walked through the doors back then. I knew I was in a room full of people that... I, that I would understand and they would understand me and they understood this man and what he is trying to accomplish and what he does and it, it was just like the biggest warmest hug ever and I haven't left since I mean the only time I'm not here is when I'm you know barfing my brains out from chemo right. or, or, or I'm traveling you know and, and it was the greatest thing ever and, you know, people can argue about coincidences. They can argue whatever they want to argue. But I'm here to tell you, this was something that was meant to happen. What he did not know at the time, and, and you all don't know, is, is when I was during that first round of chemotherapy, because I had, I had a recurrence and I had to go through chemo again. But during that first time, it was in, after my fifth chemotherapy treatment, I don't have words to articulate how ill I was. I needed complete care. My mother, who is sitting right back here, Linda Irons, um, this is hard. I, I could not care for myself. I was in a very, very, very bad place. I had a tremendous amount of pain, and, and it was constant. It wasn't a matter of trying to get through an hour. It was, it was getting through 15 minutes, five minutes. My quality of life was so poor. And I had... I don't know if you want to call it like a religious experience. I, you know, people define it different ways. But I had a, a situation where I knew I was in a place that was so poor that if I was going to have to be here, I was done fighting. I, I was, my life was no longer truly worth living. Ironically, what I didn't know was that it's one of the best things that ever happened to me because it gave me a peace that I had never known before and I have ed had ever since. That I know when I get to the, if, you know, if they don't figure out something to help me and I get to that place, I know that it's okay to let go. And I was able to come to my mother and I was able to say, Mom, if I ever come to you and I tell you I'm in this place, I don't want you to argue with me. I don't want you to try and talk me out of it. Just have peace inside that I feel so peaceful and it was during that time I I made two decisions I realized you know obviously when you're in this situation you think about your life you think about what's truly important if cancer takes you there and it was so clear it was so clear, without hesitation, the two things that were at the top, and everything else is down here. The two things that were at the top for me were, I know that for my time on this planet, on this earth, is my relationships that I have with other human beings here that are the most important things in terms of my human you know, relationships. It's the most important relationship. Uh, and I needed to do whatever I was going to do to spend as much time with people that I was going to love and care about. And that's on every level. Like, it could be a cashier at Walmart. It could be my best friend. But that's where my energy was going to go into relationships and people and having quality relationships. So that was number one. What was the second one? I've already forgotten. <laughs> it's in my chemo brain. <laughs> I'll think of it in a minute. I'll think of right. it in a minute. It was very, it's very important and profound, but I can't think of it right now. Oh, oh, I remember. It's that I spent way, 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 way too much time ever being angry or being upset or being jealous 
I don't mean like necessarily the man. I'm talking, you know, a relationship, but just not having something maybe that other people had. Um, wasted, 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 wasted energy. Mm. And um, I still struggle with that. Like every day, I still get mad. I still get annoyed. I still drive down the highway and I'm like, what is wrong with you people? You know, mm. that, that all still happens to me. But I'm much. Maybe you could have a sign that says, I have cancer. And it's just like, you know what I mean? Pull like over. I have hold cancer. It's like, get out of the way. I have priority here. Exactly. Donna, sweetie, will you bring me some Kleenex, please? I'm so sorry. My hat's not running down my face. So, thank you. Um, so, I made, I made the, those decisions right then and there that I was going to get rid of relationships and people that didn't bring joy into my world or vice versa and I was going to bring more of those people into my world and then I met him at rehab and it was the most perfect thing in the world yeah I was very glad to see you and uh, and then you started coming and you started bringing your mom and she actually comes when you're not here she really does if she tells it's you that it's because she needs it so she, bad she does she she's just <laughs> When she first came, she was real shy, and then now she just has taken over. She's like right. a door greeter. She does everything. Right. Okay, uh, Linda, why don't you come on up? This is Linda. I thought that would be a good idea to have her mom come up. Come on up for a second. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, we needed stools <clears throat> to get on the stool. <laughs> That's all right. So, Linda, uh, when she was coming to the Boomer Theater, we're doing the youth group deal. Uh, Cliff, I, ha I have a picture of me in my youth group days. If you want to, oh this looks like a guy that the people could trust their kids to, right? So, did you have any idea what was happening with her, or were you very aware that she was coming and that we well, were doing crazy stuff, and yeah, so I, you I were dropping her off, and you thought it was, was okay? Coming. Oh yeah, I thought it was great, and uh, it did. It, she really did love it and look forward to it. So. She was happy. <laughs> Save you, yes. Well, and Christine kind of skipped over the part where she went to uh, college and became a doctor, an actual doctor. I think we have a picture of that. An actual doctor. An actual doctor. <laughs> she didn't get it by mail order or anything. And, <laughs> and she delivered. And you, were you at the Chickasha thing most of your I time? Right. I was in Chickasha for eight and a half years, part of my life. And how many babies do you think you delivered during that time? It's somewhere right around. It's over three. And I know that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but when you are actually in training to be an OBGYN, it, it, it's all you, it's a like conveyor belt. <laughs> <Just good. laughs> That's real comforting to know, but. I was in a hospital where we had, I trained in a hospital where we had 26 labors. Oh my so gosh. So you literally, it was like you go from one to the other, you eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you go to another one, it's that, so it's a lot. Well, okay, and then so when you got this diagnosis, you. I closed my. You closed your practice. Okay, here's what I, I want to, to you guys to talk about first, Christine. Um, what, where were you, and when you first heard the words from a doctor, you have cancer, what, what went through your mind? So it was at the Stevenson Cancer Center. The name of my doctor is Joan Walker. I'd actually trained with her years and years before I knew her very well. She is a gynecologic oncologist. She is a very blunt woman, <laughs> very blunt. But I knew this all about her. And as, as luck would have it, here in Oklahoma City, we actually have a world-renowned gynecologic oncology center, which I know most of us would not think of. My, my actual oncologist, she helped write the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines for ovarian cancer. So I was in great hands. I knew that way ahead of time, but when I went into her office to see her, and she had my MRIs, you know, CT scan MRIs and all that, in my Christine Cooper head, I thought that I had a, a benign gynecologic thing called endometriosis because there was no piece of my brain that could even consider that I had ovarian cancer because I was unaware of much of our, our family history. And so I sat across from her, <laughs> And literally, it was like you. She walked in the door. We're in a conference room. It's mom and I. And she, she walks in the conference room. She's, she doesn't say hi. Hey, 
haven't seen you in a while. How's it going, Christine? You know, she walks in and she goes, well, so you have ovarian cancer. That is literally what she said. And, and what did I say to her? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not true. I just have a really bad case of endometriosis. And she goes, nope, I just came from radiology, and I looked at your films, and, and you have ovarian cancer. And the radiologist says the same thing, who does this every day, all day. And, and I still was just like, yeah, no. And, and so here's what went through my head. I knew that it was a terminal cancer. I, I knew it, and I really was more concerned. I knew my mother was hearing this, that this woman was telling me that her only child had cancer, and she had no clue how serious this was. Like, I knew <coughs> that she was thinking, okay, so we're going to... You, you knew from your experience oh, yeah. in... in, in being a baby well, doctor being and a, a being a gynecologist yeah. all these years. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah. whatever. I do girly parts. Yes. And so, so yes. You, you knew immediately. I what, knew, what oh, meant. I knew immediately. Yeah. And, um, and my thoughts first went to my mother that I know my mother was sitting there thinking, okay, so what are we going to do about this? And how are we, you know, what are the treatments? And la, la, la. And, and I, I just was thinking how I have to go home now and I have to tell my mother how, how <laughs> awful. Is. So this woman, she didn't say you have terminal ovarian cancer. She just said that knowing that you would know th oh, yeah. that it meant that. Oh, yeah. but, she but knew I knew Linda, exactly. you didn't know for sure that it necessarily meant that, or did no, you? No. Give, give her that mic. And yeah. I want to hear what, what happened in your mind when you first heard that. Oh, it's a gut punch. And I know everyone in this room has had this happen to them over something, like getting caught speeding, or I mean, which is minor in comparison to this. <laughs> I'm just saying where the blood just drains out of your face and 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 it it takes your breath away and that's what it was the word cancer did that and it's true i didn't know the severity of ovarian cancer and i am a fixer so immediately going through my head is okay how are we going to fix this this can be fixed we can fix this and then I, I didn't know the severity. Um, I, I will just say that it's really hard to put into words. It's more feelings. I heard the words. They were doing doctor talk. You know, they're talking to each other in doctor speak. <laughs> and, and I just remember the feeling. The feeling was this horrible, how do I fix this? How do I make this better? I could have wallowed around. I could have really gotten into a funk. And there were times when I did get into a funk. But Christine doesn't really let that happen. Because she, whenever adversity comes, she deals with it at the moment. And did she cry? Yeah, there were times she cried. It just broke my heart. Um, but then it's like, okay, in the back, moving forward. And that's what she does. So she didn't really let me wallow because I had to keep up with her. And, uh, well, I, I know that sounds kind of funny, but I had to keep up with the situation. And she was sick, uh, really, really sick. Um, and that's a really hard thing to watch. And she knows what's going on. She's savvy. I think about people who are caregivers or people who have cancer that aren't real savvy, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, the, and how hard it is when you know what's going on and you know what you need to do, um, and it's so very hard to, to do it. So um, you're a fighter, honey, and, and, and here's where we are today. Yep. I mean, her surgeon, Dr. Walker, saved her life. Chemo treats, maintains, or attempts to, but it's the surgeon who saved her life. Seven and a half hour surgery, I'm telling you, that's tough. And that's where it started. So All right. I Just could ramble on, and I no, guess I no, will. I mean, we appreciate you even being willing to do this. I didn't know if you'd even be able to, you know. When, as parents, and you think about uh, one of your kids, her only.
getting and it. And I right passed there. on the gene to her. It's a, it's a, I passed on that. You guys, uh, you guys didn't know that at the time. You found gene. that out later, right? Right. Yeah. It's a hereditary yeah. deal. Wow. Yeah. Well, Christine, why don't you tell a little bit about what you had this surgery, and then you tried different, you know, treatments, and then because of your background, you're able to maybe access some experimental or new drugs that maybe a typical person couldn't. Tell us a little bit about what happened with that. Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll make it quick. So I had their standard of care for ovarian cancer. We have actually treated ovarian cancer the same way for almost 45 years now. It's not like there have been new drugs, new changes, whatnot, until literally right as I was diagnosed with cancer. There were some new things that were out for ovarian cancer, the actual, the surgery that I had, that actually determines mortality. It's not the chemotherapy, it's, it's how well your surgeon, re, what they're all they're able to remove. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, that part was, was good. Like, I, I mean, I had a excellent care. And um, so then I had seven months of chemotherapy and what changed then I'll tell you very quickly, the normal course is that, so you have your chemotherapy and you always do well. It was the ovarian cancer responds very well to chemotherapy and you go through what's kind of a honeymoon period where it's like, hey, everything's all, all right and better. Typically, uh, about um, 16 months, 18 months later, it comes back. And that's exactly what happened with me. It comes back, you do chemotherapy again. And that cycle happens several times. And every time you go through the cycle, the cancer starts becoming resistant to the chemotherapy. And that is why it's terminal. The chemo stops working. What changed for me after, as I was actually going through that second chemo, was there was a study that came out that had been in the works for 10 years where they add a drug that can keep the cancer at bay for a longer time. It's not a cure but it can keep it at bay for a longer time. And I was immediately started on that following the chemotherapy. And it truly, up until just a few months ago, it truly is the only thing I could hang my hat on. It was is the thread of hope that as long as I can take this, and it's four pills, I take two in the morning, two at night, it's $6,000 a month. Right now I am able to, um, insurance does not cover that. I'm able to get it from the company. Um, for free and that is getting ready to end and so I have to you know if you see me out selling my body on this street you'll know why. I mean I'm not going to but I mean if you see me out there you'll know why and <laughs> you do what you have you to do, do, right? do, you have to do but no, yeah, I mean good. I'm gonna I, I don't know what I'm gonna do but I'm gonna figure it out I'm gonna figure it out because it's what I do and um, and so what has just come out this is you know as you were talking <laughs> I was very touched by several of the things you, you said today, particularly about those four things of when people say, why this happened to me, mm -hmm. why this happened to me. I've never said that. It's just not a part of who I am. I've never felt like I was being punished or it was, I, or mm -hmm. woe is me or, you know, this stuff happens. And what they have now that has come out is the technology to go in, I have an inherited form of cancer. In other words, if my gene is fixed, I'm no longer, I'm cured, is, is basically what it is. Mm. I can still get other things, right? right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you never, I get hit by a truck, whatever, but um, they have a technology now where they can go in, they, I, they go into all of your cells in the DNA, they locate that mutation, then they cut it out, put the mutation over here, and then they take a piece of DNA that is normal, that is non-mutated, and they put it back. And so every time that cell reproduces, it reproduces a normal DNA. And, and so for a while, you have more cancer cells than some less cancer cells, and as time goes on, you get less and less cancer cells until you're finally cured. And I, I, oh, I can't even tell you how I feel about this. That study came out in January, and um, the FDA decided, because it was so spectacular that, that this came about, they have fast-tracked this technology now for six different cancers. My very specific cancer is one of those six. And it, it, is, it is my greatest hope for a cure. But I, I wanna say, I, 
I don't live in this place. I don't live in a sad place. I don't. I think about my cancer several times a week because I have to, because I have side effects from the chemo and things like that. Um, but this is not where I live because you, I have, uh, we're all terminal, so to speak, right? And anything could happen to any of us at any time. And my time was valuable before, but now all of my time is very valuable to me. I fought like hell to be here today. And I need it to be not in vain, right? And I'm so happy when I wake up every day and that I have a chance to do, do this thing we call life every day, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I just, my focus now is a lot less on the ugly and the bad and a lot more on the good. And I, the la for those of you who were here the last time I spoke, I said this at the end, and it's still the best I have to offer all of you today, is reinforce the rela good relationships that you have, make new ones, and get rid of the ones that aren't bringing you closer to your, uh, to your best journey. And I really, really, really would like to see more of that here within this church. It breaks my heart. I can look out here, and I'll bet I can name 15% of you, even though I've seen you time and time again. And I would really love for my words to change how we become friends and have better relationships here within this church. We show up on, on Sundays. Some of us hang out together, some of us don't. Most of us leave, and we don't see each other again, talk again, know anything about any of us until we come back next Sunday. And I don't know what your agenda was for today. <laughs> we'll find out here in a minute. But I really, I really, really, really want people to hear me. Um, and it's not just coming to potlucks, but it's, you know, Rusty Russ gives us a chance to shake hands and meet people and greet people every morning dig a little deeper. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's get to know each other a little better. I think we would be shocked at, at the strength of the relationships that we could have within this church that you may need someday, like I needed when I walked through that door and I felt like I was home because I needed you people. I needed you people. I just needed to know that I was going to be accepted no matter what. And I had, you know, and I was bald and looked like a plucked chicken or whatever. And I needed to know that I had a safe place to land because I knew the journey I had ahead of me. And you have all provided that. And I hope I have provided some things for each of you. Um, and, and now we should talk about what you want to talk no, about. No, you, 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 you have covered everything in a roundabout way. You really have. <coughs> you really have. <coughs> Um, just to wrap it up, uh, Linda, what would you say to other families, parents here, because you're not the one who, who has the cancer, but you are the one who loves the person who, who has cancer. What have you learned or what are, what, what, uh, you know, what have you learned? What advice would you give to people when, when they're in your position? Well, I would say I did come it took me a, a while to really wrap my head around the severity of the disease. And um, Christine helped me with that. I, I would just reiterate what Christine said. Um, relationships are so very important. You cannot take for granted tomorrow. Um, those of you dealing with this with loved ones or friends or whatever I say stay strong try to stay strong tr and, and educate yourself about what's happening with the other person be an advocate be available when they can't advocate because they're so sick that you can. I, I um, uh, when Christine was in the hospital after her surgery, she was in ter 
terrible shape. I mean, a lot of pain. I shouldn't say terrible shape. It saved her life. But um, you can't even imagine the downstream of uh, stuff you deal with after the fact. And, um, and she was having some issues while she was in the hospital. And um, I needed to be there and be strong. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. I, and today, I mean, today, I, I know she has cancer. And in reality, you're in remission, so you don't have cancer, but well, you do. Well, you have some cancer yeah. in my liver. So. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Um, Did you not know that? It's okay. We'll <laughs> move on. Move on. It's okay. That's, it's okay. Is that news? No. Mm -mm. Then I probably That's knew. why I get these CT scans every <laughs> So I live for labs and CT scans, yeah. and uh, every time one's clear, you know, that's great. We move on, and, and Christine is uh, holding on to that, uh, the new drugs that are coming out, DNA, all the new um, trials and stuff. So that's where I'm at. I think of her cancer often. I don't think about it every day, but I do think about it often. Mm -hmm. And she's still dealing with it, but we'll we'll get through it together. Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, this is very real, and this is their cancer story is in progress. You know, it, they're living it right now. I wanted to end the service differently today. I don't think we've ever done this, but I wanted to have a little prayer circle, and I want to invite up anybody to join the three of us who is currently going through a cancer situation or a loved one is. You don't have to come up if you don't want. Also, I know there are some people here who have been through cancer and are on the other side of it. And you're really living the life and you're in great shape. If you would like to come up also, then uh, feel free to do that. So Kathy's coming. Anybody else who would like to come up? We're just gonna have a little prayer circle. You can come up here and join us. Everybody else can stand. We'll have our closing prayer. Okay. <laughs> I was like, you might as well all just stand up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here you go. We'll, we'll hold hands. We'll do what most church people do. We don't do it around here. Not, not like that. Well, you guys weren't even up here. You're just on the front row. That's all right. That's all right. You, got, you got pulled in. All right. Let's pray. Lord, today I, I know that even when we open up the Bible and uh, try to understand your wisdom, it's, it doesn't completely satisfy. It doesn't answer every question. And so that's where our faith comes in, and we trust you. As we said, saying earlier, I will put my trust in you. I'll try not to be afraid. Lord, we're so grateful you brought Christy back into my life and, and in the life of this church and her mom. And I pray, God, that we will be the church family to them that they need us to be. Lord, I'm so grateful to be standing here with people who have been through the battle. They've had the sleepless nights. They've had the bad effects of chemo. And yet they're standing here and they're strong and, and they're doing great. And Lord, we're really, really grateful for that. We thank you, but so many people around the world are devoting themselves to fighting this disease. And we pray that they would continue to fight. Lord, we pray especially for Christy and her mom right now as they go through this ordeal. And Lord, we just pray that uh, they would have the ability to be strong and that we would help them to be strong and that they would have faith and look forward in the positive attitude that they seek to have and God that they would just trust you and Lord that all of us here who are dealing with or families members are dealing with this that we would just seek to put you first and to know that we all die of something eventually but um, that you would just help us to walk in your ways and to trust you. Lord, well, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming. Sorry we went a little bit over, but you know how time goes. 
and uh, we'll see you next time.